Okay, so any questions before we continue? Well, this is, AC circuits is one of the most common, uh, AC current is the most common current that we use actually. The city electricity is an, it provides an AC current. So it just oscillates, its frequency is something like 50 hertz, that is 400 times the electrons change their direction per, per second. So, and we had also said that the drift velocity of the electrons is typically of the order of do you remember the drift velocity of the electrons in a current? 10 to the power minus 6 meters per second. Now the electrons in the city uh, electricity, they change their direction. Basically it's the electric field that is changing that, its direction, which forces the electrons to change their direction by 100 times per second. So they move in one direction only for 100th of a second. And the distance they cover in this time is the drift times this time t, which is typically 10 to the power minus 8 meters per second, just several atoms. And that is how much the electrons are displaced. And then after they move on the average by 10 to the power minus 8 meters, they start to move in the opposite direction. So practically electrons do not really change their position. They stay where they are. But they are basically going back and forth. And this is what transfers energy, what creates heat in the resistances, etc. Other questions? Any question? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, he doesn't want to ask. Any questions from you? usually write it as epsilon zero cosine omega t. The what are the definitions? Yeah. You say this EMF source is a function of time, it will just change like this. This is about how it will look like. It will push the current in one direction, and then at a later time, it will push it in the other direction, etc. And its maximum value is what we call epsilon zero. Now, after this time t, it starts repeating itself. So if you say it increases, decreases, to in the, move, uh, moves in the opposite direction, then increases again, and from this point on, it just repeats the same thing. This is called one period. This is one period of oscillation. And T is determined by omega. Omega is called the angular velocity. Angular speed. That's the angular speed of the actual source, right? Yes. We don't. I mean, for example, the city electricity, we will see that for the city electricity, the epsilon zero is, do you know what epsilon zero is for the city electricity? No. It's something like 370. We will see why. And what is 220? 220 is epsilon zero over square root of two. Why square root of two? We will see today. Now that is kind of, it is determined by how you generate the EMF source. It will be given. 
Other questions? In an understandable language? Well, it is the actual resistance. Resistance does, yeah. Now, yesterday, at the end of the lecture, we were looking at the RLC, RC circuits, right? Let's stick with the RC circuits. Re let's review it. So what we had in that RC circuit, we had a power source, the EMF supply, we have a resistance, and then we have a capacitor. This is the simplest circuit. This is one of the simplest circuits that you can think of. And the EMF source provides an EMF given by frequency, let's say omega, angular frequency omega. And we had written down the equation. Let's see, we start from here. Let's, this is the, we can choose this is as the positive direction of the current. So this is R, this is C. Let's say this is plus, this is minus. If you just write the potential drops across the resistor, it is I times R. Across the capacitor, it is Q over C. And this should be equal to epsilon zero cosine omega T. This is kind of the equation that we were trying to solve. And the I and Q, they are related by I is equal to dQ by dt. So let us write it in, yeah. So this is, I is dQ by dt, or let us also divide by R, or let's keep it as R, plus Q over C, this should be equal to epsilon zero cosine omega t. And now we said that, okay, so we have this driving influence which is trying to drive the current at a frequency omega, so most probably we will have a current at the frequency omega. So let's look for a current or the charge. <coughs> Q is equal to Q0 cosine omega t plus delta. And the question was, is it possible to choose Q0 and delta such that this equation will be satisfied? So that was the question we were trying to answer. And if you just take the derivative of the Q, substitute it in the equation, what you obtain is minus r omega <coughs> cosine omega t plus delta times q0 plus q0, no, this is sine. Plus q0 cosine omega t plus delta, this is equal to epsilon zero cosine omega t. And we can also write this as q0 cosine delta cosine omega t plus q0 sine delta sine omega t minus. So basically we need to determine these two unknowns. We don't know q0 cosine delta. We don't know q0 sine delta. And those two things we have to determine. And we have to determine it such that this equation is satisfied at all times t. And then we said that let's, let's rewrite this equation at time t is equal to zero. We have minus omega r sine delta, q, q0 sine delta, plus Q0 over C cosine delta. This is equal to epsilon zero. This is one equation for our two unknowns. And then we could write the same equation at omega t is equal to pi over two. And when omega t is equal to pi over two, we have minus omega r times Q0 cosine delta plus minus Q0 times sine delta over C, this should be equal to zero. So these are the two equations that we need to solve for the two unknowns. And well, it's kind of, it will be trivial to solve, you can just write, do the algebra, but let's do something else. Rather than just doing the algebra, trying to uh, find what Q0 and delta are, let's, let's use some other tools that you had learned in this year. So one of the tools that you love. So what is this? One of the tools that you have learned to use in this year 
Symmetries, okay, that, we won't use that one. Yes. I mean, you see, you remember two points, you lose two points in all the exams. Vectors, let's use vectors. So where is the vector over here? Hmm? Where is the vector? Omega term, omega is not a vector. Well, there's no vectors over here. Or let's say this equation, there are no vectors over here. But let's, let's re review what the components of vectors are. Let's say, let's assume we have two vectors. And if here we have a vector, let's say, that makes an angle theta. Let's say its length is L. So this vector, let's call it the A vector. The A vector is L cosine theta in the x direction plus L sine theta in the y direction. Do you agree? <laughs> well, let's go back to the equation that we are trying to solve, this one. This is what we would like to solve. Well, there are no vectors over here, but we can just treat this equation as the component form of a vector equation. Just one of the components. Well, you see, this is, if we take theta to be equal to omega t, this is just like a vector, the x component of a vector whose length is epsilon zero. So we can just imagine, we just invent this vector This is our epsilon zero. Its length is epsilon zero and it makes an angle omega t. So if you just write the x component of this vector, it is nothing but epsilon zero cosine omega t. Now let's look at this one. This is also a vector whose length is q zero over c but it makes an angle not omega t, but omega t plus delta. It is just rotated slightly a bit more. So this is our length is q0 over c. This angle over here is delta. Now this is nothing but the x component, the horizontal component of this blue vector. Now this looks like the vertical component, but if you want to write this as the component form of a vector equation, all of these terms should be the x components of certain vectors. But sine of this is delta. Now, sine of minus sine of omega t plus delta, this is nothing but cosine of omega t plus delta plus pi over 2. Do you agree? These two things are equal. Now, written in terms of the cosine, we can treat this, this term over here as the x component of a vector whose length is omega times r, but it is longer. It is rotated by 90 degrees with respect to this vector over here. Let me use some vector signs over there. Let, let's just call this the epsilon vector. And let us call Okay, this is the omega r. This is q0 over c. Now, this length is omega r. Let us just name this the r vector, just for notational simplicity. This is our c vector. 
And this, this red vector makes 90 degrees with the blue one because it is rotated by an additional pi over 2. Do you agree? I agree, but this is not the type of vector we do in 3D space. The only no, this, this is just two-dimensional vectors. I'm not using three-dimensional vectors. I'm using two-dimensional vectors. These are not position vectors, by the way. These are just mathematical vectors that we invent. This is not even the conventional notation, by the way. I will change my notation in the next problem. This one. This one. Well, omega r, let's, let me add it, q0. And now this equation tells me that if I take this vector and this vector and sum them up, the x component of that sum should be equal to the x component of this vector. Well, of course, that basically tells me that this delta should be something negative. <coughs> Here I assume that it was positive, but delta turns out to be negative. If I want the sum of these two to be equal to epsilon, then delta should be negative. Now, if this is satisfied, if this condition is satisfied, then the x component of this equation is nothing but this equation, so I have the solution. So you, 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 you've written it for every component, but isn't it just for the x component? True, but if this is, you see, this equation has a single solution, if it has a and if it has a single solution, and if I can find one solution, then I know that it is the solution. And if this condition is satisfied, the x component already solves this equation, so I have one solution, but the solution is unique, so I have the solution of this, that equation. I don't care. I, I only need the x component. Well, you see, the y component is just take the time derivative of that one, that equation over there, that gives you the y component. So the, this equation already, since this equation should be satisfied at all times, in fact, both the x and the y components of this vector equation should be satisfied. Well, let's see. Although we didn't follow this procedure, here we have these two equations for two unknowns. There the solution is unique. There is a single solution only. Now let me redraw this equation. Redraw this graph. So this basically, the sketch already told me that delta should be less than zero. So let me just redraw it to be more precise. So I will have, this is my epsilon, this is omega t. Now I have this vector, this, is my absolute value of delta. This vector has the length q0 over c. And this vector over here 
omega r q0. And these two are orthogonal to each other. Because they were shifted by 90 degrees. Well, here I have a right triangle. So epsilon 0 squared should be equal to q0 over c squared plus omega r q0 squared. q0 squared times 1 over, let's see, omega c squared plus r squared times omega squared should be equal to epsilon 0. And we have q0. q0 is epsilon 0 squared, epsilon 0 over omega times r squared plus 1 over omega c squared, square root. This is my q0. And if you look at, again, the same right triangle, tangent of delta is equal to omega r q0 divided by q0 over c. Q0s cancel omega times rc. So we already solved it. Now, this is called the phasor diagram. So it basically, it simplifies your life a lot. If you have, if you are trying to solve some equations involving the sines and the cosines. This is just one example. Now, any questions on this one? Now, we will generalize it to, a, to the a bit more complicated circuit next. Does it basically show uh, the tangent of the graph at a given time? Now, this graph as a whole is rotating constantly with the angular velocity omega. You see, this angle over here is omega t, so it's, it increases. This one? No, the signs. This one? No, which one? Yeah. No, in fact, you see, this is... Look at this angle over here. That is omega t. Now, that, the, that graph that we had drawn, the, of the EMF is just the graph of the X component, horizontal component of this, uh, of this vector. That is how the horizontal component changes as a function of time. Now this graph as a function of time, they all rotate as a whole with the same angular, angular frequency omega. This angle is changing omega, but delta is just a constant, it's a number, so as this black vector is rotating, both, the blue, both of the blue vectors, they are also rotating with the black one. And if you write the Q as a function of time t, this is just, we said that it's epsilon 0 over omega. This is minus 1 half, 1 over square root of r squared plus xc squared times cosine omega t plus delta. And i is just this derivative. This is minus epsilon 0, 1 over square root of r squared plus xc squared sine omega t plus delta.
Now let's do another example. It's just that there, you see, in our conventions in the circuit, the current is just a time derivative of Q. So if you just take the time derivative of this function over here, Let's look at this one. This will be a bit more interesting. Let's say this is the positive direction of the current. There's the resistance. This is plus, this is minus. As we cross the resistor, what is the drop in the potential? I times R. As we cross the capacitor, Q over C, as we cross the inductor, plus or minus? Are you sure? If you are not sure, just try it. I mean, let's say assume again di by dt is larger than zero, that is the current is increasing. If the current is increasing, the inductor will try to resist the increase. Okay, the inductor will resist the increase and hence it will tr create an EMF in the counterclockwise sense. That is basically, it will act like a battery which has the plus terminal over there and the minus terminal over here. So the potential drop will be positive. Well, LDI by DT is a positive number, so the sign has to be plus. So this should be equal to, let me also change my notation slightly. I will this time assign a sine function to the EMF source. I mean, it's just the sine and the cosine, they are basically the same functions shifted by pi over two. And rather than writing an equation for the charge, let me write an equation for the current. And we know that the current is equal to dq by dt because of our conventions of the positive charge of the current, of the positive charge and the positive direction of the current. They are, they, there's no sine over here. And then, if we just take the different, the derivative of the above equation, we will see that I over C plus di by dt times R plus L d squared I by dt squared. This is equal to epsilon zero cosine omega t times omega. The other way around. Well, if the plus charge was defined if the right plate was positively charged, in that case, here we should have a minus sign in this equation because we will be crossing from the negative plate to the positive plate. So there's a potential increase, so the potential drop will be negative. And we should get a minus sign over here. The resulting equation for the current would be the identical. Now, again, we will look for a cur uh, an expression that will rot oscillate with the same frequency but with a possible phase shift. Now, by the way, before we continue, does this equation resemble anything, the above one? The one in the box. The one in the box. 
So it is m d squared x by dt squared plus kx plus gamma x dot. This was equal to f. This is the forced oscillator. With damping. It's in fact exactly the same equation that is governing how your suspensions in the car work, basically. And this is the same equation that governs how an RLC circuit works. And the, I mean, when we were talking about the inductance, we always said that it tries to resist the change. But that is what the mass does in mechanics. The mass tries to resist the change in the velocity. The inductor tries to resist the change in the current. The capacitance is just like a spring constant. And the, the potential difference across a capacitor, which is analogous to the, the force, the driving force in that in circuit. So the capacitor tries to drive a current. And the, this driving force, in quotes, is proportional to the charge it, it has. So that is basically the x. The, the, and this capacitance behaves the role of a spring constant. And in fact, this is basically why we had in the pure RL circuit, when we had a capacitor and an inductor, we had all these oscillations. The capacitor just, first the energy was in the capacitor, then it was moved to the inductor, and then from the inductor back to the capacitor. It is just like in a spring system without any resistance, what happens is the mass just oscillates back and forth, and that during that back and forth motion, the energy is transferred from kinetic to potential and from potential to the kinetic. The potential is just like the energy stored in the uh, magnetic field, and the kinetic is just like the energy stored in the... Now, the potential is like the... Okay, the kinetic is this one. That is the pot energy stored in the magnetic field, and the kinetic... No, this is the kinetic. Is, that's the magnetic. The potential is like the energy stored in the capacitor. So the mathematical analogy is just perfect. Whatever, whatever you have in the mechanical system, you have a similar phenomena in the electromagnetics, in the, in the circuits. Now let's, let's try to solve this equation, this forced oscillator. What we need to do is just take this curl, place it in the above equation over here, and try to determine what I0 and delta are. Let's, let's first substitute it. We have I0 over C times cosine omega t plus delta plus or minus I0 omega sine omega t plus delta minus L omega squared d I0 times cosine omega t plus delta. This should be equal to omega epsilon zero cosine omega t. Let us also cancel, divide both sides by one omega. So this is minus L omega squared I zero cosine omega t plus delta minus I zero omega sine Omega, no, I divided one omega. Now, where is the resistance? It's over here. Plus I zero over omega C cosine omega T plus delta. This is equal to epsilon zero cosine omega t. Will you get too confused if I change one more notation? Hmm? Yes? Okay, then I won't change it. Now, let's see. What was Excel? Do you remember the inductive impedance or the inductive reactance? 
it's omega L. And XC. And that is that one over here. Let's, let's rewrite it minus XL I0. I0 times minus XL cosine omega T plus delta minus, let's say, XR sine omega T plus delta. plus xc cosine omega t plus delta. This is equal to epsilon 0 cosine omega t. Now again, let's just show all of these in a phasor diagram. Let's just imagine this line, this is, makes an angle omega t. So this is the omega t. If you consider the horizontal component, this just is the horizontal component of a vector whose magnitude is epsilon 0. And this is the horizontal component of a vector whose magnitude is xc times i0, and it makes an angle omega t plus delta. Let's say this is delta. This is again the horizontal component of a vector whose length is xl i0, but it's just in the opposite direction to that one. So this is xc i0, this is xl i0. And then we have this one, this xr. Now minus xr sine omega t plus delta, well, we can also write it in terms of some cosines. This will be xr times cosine omega t plus delta plus pi over 2. So it just makes the angle that this vector makes should be just 90 degrees more. So that is such a vector. And again, the only thing you need to do is just sum all these vectors so that you will obtain a vector whose magnitude is epsilon 0 and it's along this line. Are you following? Now, the last. Now, what we are actually doing here is we have this equation. We need to solve this equation using whichever method you like. And if you can get one equation, one solution, we know that that is the only one. So it doesn't really matter which method that we use to obtain a solution. If we can find one, then we are happy. Then the question is, how do we solve these ones? Now we make this interpretation, or this analogy, let's say. We can write this as one of the components of a vector equation. Let me rewrite another equation. Let me take this one. Okay, this is the equation that we are trying to solve. Well, if this equation is valid at all times, 
then I can just take the time derivative of that equation, it should still be satisfied. And now, if I take the time derivative, well, all the cosines and sines, they will bring a factor of omega. I will just divide by that omega. So I will not write that omega. If we take its time derivative, we get L omega I zero sine omega t plus delta minus R I zero cosine omega t plus delta minus I zero over omega c sine omega t plus delta. This should be equal to minus epsilon zero cosine omega sine omega t. Now you can just interpret both of these equations as the horizontal component. You see this it has the cosine, this is the vertical, this is the horizontal, this is the vertical component. This is the horizontal, this is the vertical component. Well, you need to add a pi over two over here. In that case, this will be the horizontal, this will be the vertical component of vectors. And similarly over here, this will be the horizontal component of a vector, this will be the vertical component of some other vector. Okay? So that is basically what we are doing over here. Now let's see. Let me draw those vectors using this interpretation. I'm trying to write a vector corresponding to epsilon zero. Now this will be more closer to the convention. The x co horizontal component is positive, the vertical component is negative. So epsilon zero vector is basically this one. This is my epsilon zero vector, or epsilon vector. And this angle over here is omega t. Do you see it? And we will get the same result basically, but we don't need to just switch back and forth. So this is the cosine omega t, the horizontal one. This is the vertical one that is minus sine omega t. Now let's look at this, comp this vector. Again, for this vector also, the, vert the horizontal component is plus, the vertical component is minus, but it makes an angle omega t plus delta, not omega t. Let's, again, just for sketching pur purposes, let's assume delta is positive for the time being, then we will determine whether it is positive or not. So this is our I0 times Xc. It is the horizontal component of this vector is this term, the vertical component is this one. Let's look at this one. Both the horizontal and the vertical components, they are both negative. And uh, the sine of, or we can, let's just uh, write it in this way. Okay, it is, this is the horizontal component, this is the vertical component. Uh, we can just imagine these as rotated by delta. My pi over two, sorry. So let's see. So basically it's this one. Now this angle over here is omega t plus delta. So the horizontal component is minus sine omega t plus delta. The vert vertical component is minus cosine omega t plus delta. This is the r times i zero term. And finally, this one, the horizontal component is negative. The vertical component is positive. It is basically this vector over here. This is. Uh, XL times I zero. And again, it turns out that we have to somehow draw the delta to be negative. The sum of all these three vectors over here should be equal to this one. I, I zero times R. Oh, they are the same. 
what do we know about that vector? That vector should have minus sine omega t plus delta as the horizontal component, is the sine, and minus uh, I0 r times cosine omega t plus delta as the vertical component. Well, if you look at this one, this angle is omega t plus delta. Then I0 r times cosine omega t plus delta is this height, the vertical component in the negative direction. And I0 r times sine omega t plus delta is this length over here in the negative direction. Now, I just took the time derivative of the first equation. It gave me the second one. OK. So um, and we also said that the y component was the y derivative. No, no, I, I didn't say the y component is the y derivative. Kind of but I said, this is my original equation. And it has to be satisfied at all times. Now, if it is satisfied at all times, I can just imagine two very nearby times. Take their difference, divide by their uh, difference by the differences in time, but that is the time derivative. So I can just take the time derivative of this equation, so this equation should also be satisfied at all times. So I have these two equations. Then what I'm doing is I'm just reinterpreting, let's say, these two equations as a vectorial equation, saying that these two equations are in fact, the equal they represent the equality of two-dimensional vectors. But basically the same. Yeah. Or you can imagine I'm multiplying this equation by x hat, I'm multiplying this equation by y hat, and it becomes a vectorial equation. Then the next thing is, how do we draw those vectors? And if you just draw those vectors, this is the x horizontal, this is the vertical component, so this is how they look like. Up to you. You can choose this as the vertical component or this as the horizontal component. That's up to you. Now, rather than redrawing everything, in the sketch, now this is a straight line. because they both make 90 degrees with this third vector over here. If you just sum all these, you obtain a vector somewhere over here. So I will just, let me just erase this one. So this is my epsilon. Now this is minus delta, this is omega t. Now, of course, for this to be true, this should be shorter, i0. Uh, just for sketching, I didn't know their length, but just to have a proper picture, let's say. Now, this plus this should be pointing somewhere in that direction. This should be a bit longer. This is xc times i0. Let me also draw this one a bit shorter i0 times r. Now this vector over here is xc minus xl times i0. This vector over here has a length i0 r. They are perpendicular to each other. So that epsilon 0 squared should be equal to I0 squared R squared plus I0 squared times XC minus XL squared. And from here we have, we have I0 is equal to epsilon 0 over Z, where Z is square root of R squared plus XC minus XL squared. And tangent of minus delta, this is equal to I0 R over I0 
times Xc minus Xl. Or tangent delta is equal to R over Xl minus Xc. Now, this is the solution. Now, next hour, okay, there's lots of algebra, lots of mathematics, etc. In the next hour, we will just discuss what are the consequences, okay? So we have the solution, but what does the solution mean? What kind of a physical phenomena we will observe in this case? This is my omega t. This is, these are the length. I mean, all of these symbols, they denote the length of the corresponding vectors. They're not the vector, I'm not, I didn't label the vectors. They all correspond to the length of those. This vector has a length i0 r. This vector has a length xl times i0. But in the mechanical analog, I mean, this just this oscillating motion back and forth. But you see, this harmonic motion is nothing but the, let's say, one component of uniform circular motion. If you just take an object that is doing uniform circular motion, and if you just choose, follow its horizontal component only, it will make simple harmonic motion. The equation we have is the equation for the simple harmonic motion. But then we are reinterpreting it as the horizontal component of uniform circular motion. It is the uniform circular motion of the phasers. Now, one interesting phenomena will ha happen. What happens when XL is equal to XC? Okay, we will discuss it next hour. <laughs>